Welcome to, to welcome to all of you. So good evening, good good night, good morning, depending on uh, where you are in the world. I'm actually here from India. I know probably some of you are in Europe or even in North America. So happy you can spend an hour with me to learn about uh, Kubernetes and the ecosystem around Kubernetes. So the goal for this webinar is to talk about more real-world Kubernetes. So if you join the last, the previous session, it kind of introduced Kubernetes and what it can do. Here we're going to talk about more around what it actually looks like to use and deploy Kubernetes. So this is for those of you who are either A, not using Kubernetes, or B, or kind of are already started and maybe want to go further or you know just want to know what's going on so I prepared a presentation to talk about uh, production preparedness uh, and uh, cluster ops and the ecosystem around Kubernetes uh, once I finish my presentation I'll turn it over uh, for Q&A uh, and I hope that we get some uh, good questions because I think the uh, I think you all will benefit the most from the from the QA. So feel free to dump your questions in the chat during the session. Uh, at the end of the session, we I will collect all of the answers, collect all of the questions, and do my best to answer as many as possible. Uh, whatever question is uh, not answered, I will also answer in writing on the Cloud Academy community forum and there will also be a written blog post summary posted probably next week or so for those of you who like uh, written summaries or maybe for anybody who hasn't caught the webinar in person. So that being said I have uh, prepared a poll for all of you uh, to gauge where you are and then to decide how we should continue with the webinar. So if you can please uh, fill in the poll and let me know what best describes you. Okay, thank you everyone. So we have about a half and half split between never used it and about half of you who have uh, used it in development or any other pre-production stage. So I think that what we can do with this session is hopefully educate those of you who are using it in depth uh, to better be prepared for how to move forward with the production. Uh, and for those of you who have never used Kubernetes, this will hopefully give you a better overview of what a sort of um, full circle type thing looks like, not necessarily just in development, but more towards the production side of things. Uh, and then for those of you who have never used it, I recommend the part one where we introduce Kubernetes and have a demo of what you can, uh, what you can do. So that being said, let's dive into the content. So uh, my name is Adam Hawkins. I run the site reliability engineering team at SaltSite. Right now we have roughly 350 or so containers in production, which is growing actually every day. Uh, I've been using Docker for two years and working with containers almost uh, exclusively since then. I've prepared the introduction to Docker course, also on Cloud Academy, and a currently work in progress introduction to Kubernetes course, which will hopefully be published uh, soon enough. And you can tweet me and find my blog, uh, link to my blog there. So what we're really going to talk about is three topics. Um, one, the first is production preparedness. So this is sort of the not necessarily the most established best practices because Kubernetes is quite a new technology, but the practices and things you should consider before going to production. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, application packaging and cluster ops. This is uh, two tools in particular. So as end users, how can you build and develop your applications and easily deploy them to Kubernetes? And also cluster ops, which is short for cluster operations, which is essentially all of the work around building, maintaining, and operating uh, clusters from the kind of sysadmin or operation staff perspective. And also we'll investigate some of the useful tools uh, provided by the ecosystem, some paid and some free, and hopefully we'll have plenty of time for Q&A so I can answer all of as many questions as I possibly can, especially for those of you who are almost or maybe considering going to production. So we'll start off by talking about production preparedness. So what I'm going to cover is really sort of two different aspects of this. One is 
maybe features in Kubernetes that you may have not heard about before, or if you've done some tutorials, uh, maybe you haven't gotten this far yet, but I want to highlight some resources or some features in Kubernetes that you should use when you're about to go to production or already in production. And also some practices that you should apply once you commit to going forward to production with Kubernetes. So first up is what I call these useful resources. So you may not use these things, say, in a development or phase where you're just sort of evaluating technology, but there are a set of resources that you will definitely use when you build a you know, real-world application. So the first is daemon set. So what a daemon set does, and here again, I assume that you have some experience. So I know that half of you have not really used it before, but a daemon set, uh, what it does is allow you to schedule a pod, or in this case, a container on every single node in the cluster. So let me highlight a particular use case for this particular resource. So all of us need monitoring of our clusters. So you can run through the daemon set a monitoring agent on each node of the cluster in a container. That container can say talk back to your container runtime, e.g. Docker, find out about all the other containers running on a particular node and report all the stats back up to your metric collection system. So personally, I haven't really found another use for this beyond the monitoring case, but that being said, if you need monitoring for your cluster or metric collection, this is a fantastic way to do it. Next up is stateful set. So a word of warning with this particular uh, functionality. So most of us, when we talk about containers, what we're really talking about is stateless application containers. Uh, these things can, they can be thrown away, they're easily scaled horizontally, you know, there's not really any order or anything that's important about the containers, the way that we group or design our applications. But not every single application is like that. Some applications need to have uh, ordering, uh, ordering guarantees specifically. So, for example, uh, let's consider an app, uh, a system like MongoDB. First you bring up an arbiter, then you bring up a primary, then you bring up a secondary. So there's an order in which these containers need to, need to be created and perhaps an order in which they need to be destroyed or updated when code changes happen. So you can use a stateful set for these kind of applications. Now, I raise a red flag here on this particular type of resource because odds are if you're dealing with this kind of application, you may not want to be running it on something like Kubernetes. So you can do it, but the primary goal of this kind of technology is the horizontally scaled stateless application containers. So you can, of course, investigate this area, but take it with a grain of salt. I personally just sort of stay away from this area uh, completely, especially especially in a production environment. So if you have like a test environment or a staging environment where you need a database or some other kind of stateful, stateful application like that, this might be okay, but in terms of an actual production environment, stay away. So I also want to highlight cron job and job. So Every application of some sort of business value usually tends to have some kind of chronological business reports or generated some kind of thing based on some other data. So Kubernetes includes job, which is a set of uh, containers or pods executed in the sequence. Kubernetes will track the execution of this job all the way through the pipeline, so you can see, okay, this number of containers is finished. And you can also schedule them with the cron job resource. It's basically the job just but on a schedule. So something to keep in mind for those of you who are you know, having to generate reports or do any sort of other cron activity. The nice thing here is that you don't necessarily need to have a container that's running cron to kick off your things. Kubernetes can actually take care of that for you. So this one is actually my personal favorite because I think it's the coolest. Uh, what Ingress does is gives you a way to control incoming traffic from the public internet to your cluster. So 
we're going to see a short code example of what this can do. But if you think about ingress, this is more like if you consider putting a, like an Nginx in front of your whole cluster, um, where you can do like virtual host things, even a kind of a quasi API gateway where you can map particular paths, say like slash app A goes to this set of containers, slash app B goes to this set of containers. Ingress is a really, really powerful thing. Um, and I suggest you do look into it if you have not started with Kubernetes or if you are currently using Kubernetes in development or any other pre-production stage. I highly, highly recommend that you take the time to read the Ingress guide to understand what it is and perhaps how you can leverage that for your particular application. So here we have an example from the Ingress guide actually. And so what this is pretty cool is you can create an ingress point for say all sets or like multiple services inside your cluster. So this is particularly useful because you can say have an external point where you, you know, control traffic through, like where you can say apply your firewall rules or something like that. This kind of thing might be especially useful if you're running your application behind something like Cloudflare where your system has to be exposed to the public internet but you only want to whitelist say the network traffic coming from Cloudflare or whatever place. So well, this example, it is sort of how I described where you can say on this host map slash food to this particular Kubernetes service slash bar to this other, other kind of service. Well, this is just a small example of what you can actually do with Ingress. So I highly recommend that you check out the Ingress guide and read this because this is sort of the evolution of exposing multiple services outside of a particular cluster, and it's going to be really, really important going forward. So now that we've covered some small bits of Kubernetes that you should keep in your head before going to production, now I want to talk a little bit about production practices. So first one is to set request limits, so resource request and limits. So in this case, or in this context, a resource request applies for an ask to the cluster for a particular amount of CPU or memory. So this is the minimum CPU or memory for the particular container to function. The limit is the maximum CPU or memory. So if you don't set the, if you don't set the minimum or the maximum, then whatever sort of generic semantics apply, the container can allocate memory or claim more CPU, you don't necessarily know. However, when you request the minimum and maximum, you know that one, this container will either receive the compute resources that it needs or it will fail to schedule, or B, that this container cannot over consume the resources of my cluster so that you're more insulated from, say, weird application things, or you can maintain that you always have a particular headroom on the overall CPU or memory of your cluster so that applications that require more compute resources always have a headroom to scale out. So regardless of which one you do, I advise that you do set the requests uh, and limits. What this will also do is ensure that you have a higher resource utilization across your cluster. So if you're dealing with hundreds of containers or even 20 containers in two particular nodes, you want to be able to pack as many containers as you can on a particular node. And the only way that Kubernetes knows how to do that effectively is by telling it about the uh, resource requests and limits. This point here, separate critical and non-critical workloads, is really a follow-up from the previous point. So one of the reasons why, for those of you who have not used Kubernetes before, one of the reasons to consider using a technology like Kubernetes is to achieve higher resource utilization across a given set of compute resources. In this case, it might be uh, virtual machines or uh, physical machines. But regardless, those, uh, those computers, physical or virtual, providing some compute resources, CPU memory to the cluster. And different containers, different applications are going to have different requirements for what sort of C, you know, what kind of CPU do they need? So let me give you a concrete example of this. So let's take AWS. Uh, AWS has multiple instance types. We take the C series, which is, say, uh, compute optimized 
compared to the T series, which is really not for production stuff. A CPU on the T series is not the same as one CPU on the C series. The reason is that on the T series, the CPU may be throttled depending on how much you use it. So what this means is that you can use this to your advantage if you separate out these critical and non-critical workloads, you can say that these applications require you know, a higher class of CPU or a higher class of compute, they can go over here, versus these containers can go over there. You can use either like a combination of request limits, you know, a combination of minimum uh, resources and a maximum limit on those resources to help Kubernetes distribute the containers most effectively across the whole cluster for the highest resource utilization, which in turn will yield the lowest infrastructure cost. Now, node selectors are another follow-up to the previous point, which is that you can instruct Kubernetes using what we call node selectors to say, ah, these containers need to be on this class of node, like if we consider a, um, heterogeneous cluster, you might have some machines in that cluster which have faster CPUs, some have more memory, and some are just sort of whatever, random general purpose machines. You can, in your uh, in your pods and all of these things, set your node selectors so that Kubernetes knows that these containers should be placed on a particular node. So this is especially important for those of you who have uh, heterogeneous clusters, uh, especially uh, on maybe even a mix of physical or virtual, you can target different like data centers or anything like that depending on how you label your particular nodes. So regardless, if you combine these three points, you can have high resource utilization while guaranteeing that the containers of your application receive the appropriate compute requirements for them to function according to whatever kind of requirements that you have. Now, this one, I would say, is an actual mandatory practice. So for those of you who are already using Kubernetes, maybe you've heard the term liveness and readiness probes. For those of you who have not used Kubernetes, liveness and readiness probes are what you may, excuse me, uh, what you may have heard to, may have heard referred to as health checks, except for Kubernetes separates them out into two different behaviors. So a liveness probe is used to test if a container should be killed and restarted. A readiness probe means that it should be taken out from or removed from service, aka removed from a load balancer until this probe passes. So you need to define these two probes for each containers for each container to instruct Kubernetes about how this container behaves during its life cycle. This is especially important when you do something like a deployment, which Kubernetes needs to know that uh, these containers, these new containers have come up and they are in fact alive and ready. So if you are using Kubernetes and you have not looked into probes yet, then that should be your one takeaway from this webinar is to immediately Google Kubernetes probes and understand how these work and implement them in your application. Without defining the probes, your containers will never be working correctly as defined by your application's requirements. They will only be working kind of as described by general container semantics. Next up, add telemetry. So the term telemetry refers to uh, data required to understand the current state of a particular system. So telemetry data typically is one time series data and two logs. So in terms of, uh, say, Kubernetes in production, there are two perspectives to consider. There is the application developer, the person who is actually uh, the end user of Kubernetes, who's creating, uh, you know, deploying containers to the system. They need to understand what sort of what the load looks like on those containers, what is the, you know, what's basically going on with those containers. The other side of the equation is from the sort of the cluster ops, the sysadmin operation staff perspective, what's going on with the aggregate of all the machines in the cluster. So 
how much memory do I have in the cluster, how much full CPU do I have in the cluster, how many containers are running, you know, what's my headroom on these things look like. So you need to really come up with a strategy of how you're going to do this. You can use the daemon set, which is a monitoring agent, like I described earlier. There's a few different ways to accomplish this, but ultimately you need to have a plan to collect telemetry data and pipe it out to something else so you can, say, analyze the current state in relation to the past state. Now, this other one is more for the operation side. So this is more where I come in, being the SRE team. So this is, you have to understand how you're going to do node maintenance. So let's consider a cluster that has n number of nodes. One of those nodes may have a problem, like maybe you have a physical machine, maybe there's a disk failure, or maybe you know that you're going to have to replace a machine. So there are procedures and workflows in place. You can use the Kubernetes uh, or the kubectl command to cordon off nodes and drain pods and handle this sort of thing. And there's guides on doing this all, all the stuff, but you need to make sure that as a team, you know how to handle these kind of maintenance concerns and things that will come up during the lifetime of this whole system. Next one is plan your availability. So if you're running a cluster in a test environment, odds are you probably don't care as much as if you're running, say, the lifeblood of your business on Kubernetes. So there's two factors that are two different, there's a few different ways that you can plan, that you can increase the availability of your system. One of them is to do a multi-master setup. The other thing is to actually do a, um, a federated cluster, which is basically a combination of multiple clusters. So if you can consider, say, one cluster running in some physical data center, one cluster running in, say, on AWS, and another cluster running on GCP, you could actually compose one cluster from all of those three, cluster, three clusters, and that's called a federated cluster. So just make sure you have a plan for what your availability looks like, decide on if you need HA, and how you're going to achieve that. So for the developers here, is that make sure you have your different, you know, all your various Q, you know, Kubernetes YAML slash JSON file under source control. These are critical, critical, uh, you know, pieces of code related to your application. So they should be kept under source control and these things should be linted or verified somehow during whatever kind of test process you have. Because if you're deploying to Kubernetes, you certainly don't want a typo or other sort of, you know, unfortunate mistake in one of these files not being caught until you actually try to deploy it. So it's a very simple thing to keep them under source control and let them, and I highly recommend that you do that. Finally, secure your cluster. So there is a whole topic on how to do this, and you can refer to the Kubernetes documentation and the guides. They're much more in depth than what I can go into now. But there are a few different authentication modes uh, available for Kubernetes. So just go to the docs, read one, pick one, and implement it. Just make sure that you have secured it in some way. So now we're about 25 minutes in, probably got to speed up a little bit. So now we're going to talk about application packaging uh, and cluster ops. So Helm is what you could consider a package manager for Kubernetes applications. So I'm guessing that most of us here have used the package manager in some way. This would be, say, Homebrew on OSX, App on Debian or Ubuntu, Pac-Man on Arch, or even my favorite Portage on Gentoo, but you get the idea. We're all sort of familiar with the idea that we should be able to run a command. The package manager will do everything required to download that and get it running on our system. And then we also, as end users, expect these package managers to give us some sort of useful functionality like being able to search for alternate versions, upgrading versions, pending versions, even rolling back to particular versions. So this is exactly what Helm is. So what Helm does is package up the Kubernetes application, which is really a set of all of these different resources, like uh, deployments, services, daemon sets, physical volumes, ingress, all the different items of 
Kubernetes resources you can think of into what they call a Helm chart. Now, uh, a Helm chart uh, can be installed on a particular cluster with a different release name. So in this case, we can see we're going to install a, install a chart named MySQL using the name App MySQL. So as a user of this tool, you can take a chart and install it multiple times on the same cluster. I've used this example here because if you consider applications, you probably have multiple applications running on a cluster. Maybe more than one needs MySQL in this example. So you can say, you know, Helm install app A, MySQL, MySQL. Helm install app B, MySQL, MySQL. You get the idea. So you can also roll back. So you can roll back to like the last installed version. You can also give it a specific version to roll back to because it knows all of the charts that are installed or running, uh, what they call releases on the cluster. So you have that install and roll back. You also, of course, have like, I think it's called uh, Helm list, which will tell you about all the things that are running on it, all of the releases that are installed on the cluster. So you can also create your own charts, of course. So for the people that, more of the application developers in the audience is especially useful for you because uh, you can create a chart to package up your application. This is especially, especially, especially useful. I mean, I'm sorry if I repeat that, but I can't really, it's hard for me to emphasize how useful this is. This is especially useful if you have like a microservices application or any sort of, you know, non-monolithic type architecture where you're going to have maybe n number of components, this might be 3, this might be 10, 20, 30, or 50, you know, pick any number of n. But you can package all of those things up as an individual Helm chart, publish it to your repo, uh, your repo server, that's what they call it, the chart, the chart repository. And you, all of the members in your team can use this to run your particular application. So once you have actually created your chart, you can package it up to the chart file and publish it on what they call the chart repository. So if you're curious about what you, how you can deploy your applications to Kubernetes if you're not used to it, then I recommend you check out uh, this tool called Helm we're talking about now. And if you are actively using Kubernetes and you're preparing to go for production, you maybe you've written some of these YAML files, you've worked with some applications, then I recommend you check into Helm to see how that can perhaps optimize whatever workflows you already have going on. So now for cluster ops. So KOps, which is short for Kubernetes operations, is essentially kubectl but for clusters. That's my well, truthfully, I, I took that out of the README, but that's that's the idea. So what KOps is is a tool for provisioning, maintaining, and administering clusters. Specifically, right now, it supports uh, AWS. Uh, they plan to support uh, GCP and Azure in the future, but right now, we're really only talking about AWS here. So what KOps does is it allows you to create clusters. So you can pass it some operations. Now, the thing that's really powerful about KOps is that it takes out all of the grunt work about how you actually need to provision and install Kubernetes. And if you've ever set up a distributed system, Kubernetes is no different. I mean, these are not simple things to just install. They're not one-line things you need to set up n number of machines, configure all these networking things, run different software on each kind of machine, join them all up, verify it. You know, you get the idea. But chaos automates this process, and you can give it different kind of customization options. So, for example, you can tell chaos to create a, uh, a multi-master cluster. You can tell Kubernetes that, or you can tell Chaos that you want to create a cluster in an existing AWS VPC. You can tell Chaos that you want this to be in a private network or a public network. You can tell Chaos to um, create a bastion for SSH access. You can tell you which machines to use, which Kubernetes version to use. Um, all you can even tell it which network manager to use. So you get the idea. A lot of these. Uh, things, a lot of these sort of choices and things that will need to say operation staff or hopefully if you're a full stack team, all of you are working on this, but ultimately these clusters have to come from somewhere. 
and creating them as a non-trivial thing. And KOps does optimize or does do a pretty good job of setting up clusters for you. So once you create it, you can edit it. So if you've used kubectl before, you're kind of familiar with the workflow of saying kubectl creates a dash f example.yml. KOps behaves in the same way. So if you're familiar with that workflow, you'll find that it's quite easy to move to KOps instead of editing, say, deployment specs or editing cluster specs. And KOps can actually do like upgrades on clusters to change the versions that are running. It can also, oh, I missed one point. They actually didn't make it into the slide. But you can also do like rolling, uh, rolling updates to clusters. So from these two ends of the spectrum between Helm, you have a tool for the, like, the engineers to package up and deploy their applications to, uh, to a Kubernetes cluster. And from the operations side, you have tools like KOps, which can automate provisioning and administration of these clusters. All right. So now we can talk a little bit about the ecosystem before moving on to uh, the Q&A. So, Kubernetes does have a really vibrant ecosystem around it. I mean, coming from, I mean, I've been doing open source for some time, but I, I tell you that I think there's actually something unique about what's going on in the Kubernetes community and sort of the energy around Kubernetes itself. And I think that this shows from the work that the community is doing and the tools that we have uh, as we work with Kubernetes. So the first one I want to highlight is the actual official Kubernetes charts repo. Uh, this is the official repo where all of the official Helm charts live. So odds are if you need something like MySQL or Redis or anything like that, you can look at the official chart. Um, and like I mentioned before, you can package up any size application as a Helm chart. Uh, and I'm not sure what they are with this, but they're actually working on packaging up OpenShift as a Helm chart so you can run OpenShift on a Kubernetes cluster and it's all with one command. So that's pretty cool stuff. So for those of you who are not using Kubernetes right now, I suggest that you look into this charts repo as an example of how to write good Kubernetes resource specs. So if you just need to install stuff, they got it. If you want to learn good examples, you can also find it here. Now, there are also a lot of tools around the provisioning and the administration of Kubernetes itself. So one of these things is Tectonic from CoreOS. And what Tectonic does is sort of wrap the whole Kubernetes thing in this, you know, nicer package, a little bit more complete sort of product offering from them. So they also have their own tool to uh, bootstrap uh, Kubernetes clusters using CoreOS on AWS. They call it, I think it's like Kube AWS, the command including this TikTok thing. So if you're a fan of sort of like pre-packaged solutions, not necessarily turnkey, but you know, a full kind of featured thing, then Tectonic might be, you know, something to investigate. It's not free, um, but, you know, it might be worth it. So this one is pretty interesting. Uh, the Kubernetes Enterprise Toolkit, also abbreviated, abbreviated KIT. I don't know why, but anyway, it's from AppRenda, and this is a nice suite of tools to um, basically do a lot of different things around Kubernetes in production. Uh, they have tools for bootstrapping clusters. They also have a particular interesting tool called uh, Kubarang, which is sort of like a, uh, a smoke test tool for clusters. So if you've just set up a new cluster, you can use Kubarang to kind of verify some semantics and smoke test its functionality. There's a whole suite of tools to look into. Um, in uh, in this project. Next up, Google Container Engine. So Google Container Engine is 
hosted Kubernetes on Google Cloud Platform. Uh, and this is, uh, well, great if you like hosted solutions, um, but also Kubernetes comes from, from Google. So the, probably the best people at running and maintaining Kubernetes are, is Google. So you can leverage their power to just say, have hosted Kubernetes. So for those of you who are not uh, using Kubernetes right now, if you are on, uh, if you're using Google Cloud, then you can create a uh, Kubernetes cluster in one click using using JK, uh, GKE. Uh, for those of you who are using Kubernetes in a pre-production stage, I recommend that you do take a peek into Google Container Engine. And what I have said uh, before in some of my uh, past talks and other sessions is that if you're on AWS and you're really serious about Kubernetes, that it might make sense to even consider switching to Google Cloud Platform just for Google Container Engine. So that's something to consider. Now, so far we have talked about basically tools that you can use to save yourself from doing work. Now, this is great if you have things to do. I know that all of us have deadlines and want to just, you know, move forward with the things that we need to do. But unfortunately, uh, tools like GKE or KOps may not, may not work for everybody. So somebody is going to actually have to set up that system from scratch. So there's a fantastic resource by Kelsey Hightower called Kubernetes the Hardway, um, which is, in my opinion, a fantastic reference guide on how to uh, set up and configure Kubernetes, but not necessarily. I don't. I don't consider it a tutorial, for example. I mean, you can you can take it like that, but it's a fantastic reference guide on all of the different bits that go in that you know go into what you need to know uh, to set up Kubernetes from scratch. Now, Kubernetes is a very fast evolving technology and the ecosystem is growing quite a bit and things are changing quite, uh, quite a lot, okay? So, I want to share one bit of advice uh, with all of you before moving over to the Q&A is that uh, uh, way back when I got involved in uh, Ember.js when it was, say, alpha software, not necessarily even beta. Um, and the thing that I learned from that experience was that when you're dealing with a technology that is really new and still evolving, the only way to really understand uh, what's going on in the ecosystem and with the stack is to be involved in the community, uh, talk to as many people as possible, uh, follow, the pod, follow the projects, understand the direction, uh, understand the key players, you know, follow the git, you know, follow the GitHub issues, follow the change logs. You know, you really have to um, invest the time to understand the software, understand the limitations, and sort of synthesize your own best practices, your own experience from the experiences of others. Uh, Kubernetes is not something that is, you know, 20 years old where you can just Google up exactly, you know, all of the answers to your questions. A lot of us are, you know, still figuring this out as we go along. Uh, some of us have been using it for longer than others, of course, but for the most part, we're all just getting started with this in some way. So the uh, Kubernetes Slack channel is, I think, the best way to get involved with the community, uh, get out, you know, get in contact with your fellow users, and generally just sort of get a feel for how, what, you know, for what people are doing and you know, like what's going on. So if you can take anything away from this session, for those of you who are uh, not using Kubernetes yet, is that the best way to prepare yourself for you know, real world Kubernetes is to get involved in the community. For those of you who are already using Kubernetes in a pre-production stage and want to go to production, this is the best place to find people who are already in production to talk to them, to understand their experiences, and to you know hopefully get some answers to any questions that you have. 
So that being said, in the to transition from questions, that's what I had to share with you. Now I'm happy to spend as much time as I can answering as many questions uh, uh, from you all. All right. So now I've got to minimize that. Now I can see the webinar panel. Let's find the chat. All right. Okay, so first question. Uh, what is the main advantage of Kubernetes compared to Docker Swarm? So in my opinion, they're, they're quite similar in terms of their overall functionality uh, with one key difference. Um, I will not necessarily that say this may be an advantage for some or a disadvantage for others. So Docker Swarm is the first party uh, tool from Docker Inc. for orchestration. And they particularly target, um, of course, uh, Docker containers. Uh, Kubernetes itself is not container runtime uh, dependent. So with Kubernetes, you can actually run rocket containers and other things like that. So that is one of the main advantages. Um, and the other one, I think, is just a more vibrant community or ecosystem, a different perspective in that what Kubernetes is trying to do is create a you know, platform agnostic system for running containerized applications. Uh, Docker Inc. through Docker Swarm will always be more focused on their particular technology, in this case Docker. Not that that's a bad thing, but it, it's certainly different. But the biggest difference is that Kubernetes targets multiple container runtimes uh, and that is a fantastic thing. All right. Okay, here's a next question. Have you worked with or looked into Terraform in conjunction with Kubernetes? So to unpack that question, I'm guessing the uh, question here, is that a word? or is that a word, uh, is talking about using Terraform uh, to uh, provision Kubernetes clusters. Uh, so it's funny you ask that question because chaos can actually output Terraform files. Then you can run them, uh, run them with Terraform. Uh, personally, I have used like Ansible to do some of this stuff, but I think ultimately it kind of falls into this, this same bucket. Um, that you can, you know, get it done, but it's not necessarily mature as mature compared to other technologies. All right. I am new to this, and this question might have been asked. But what is what is OpenShift and the relationship with Kubernetes? So I will do my best to understand. Uh, um, uh, or to kind of simplify what OpenShift is in relationship with Kubernetes is that uh, OpenShift is basically like a huge platform for running like a whole business on a particular technology. So it's kind of an, an OpenShift is an abstraction across a large sort of infrastructure to provide a kind of more infrastructure as a service on top of something else. And uh, OpenShift actually uses Kubernetes under the covers for some of those things. So Kubernetes is a lower level abstraction compared to what uh, OpenShift is. Okay. All right. What is your opinion on separating production and non-production via different clusters versus separating with namespaces and ABACs or BACs? Okay. So my opinion on this really comes down to uh, how strict or what kind of uh, infrastructure you want to use uh, for the, say, production and non-production clusters. Um, but both of these things do involve some sort of um, some sort of access control in some way. So what what I am going for right now is one cluster for production. Uh, with a particular set of 
you know, EC2 instances optimized for the production requirements, and one cluster for all other non-production use cases, or all, all other non-production use cases with lower cost hardware. Say, for example, in production there might be, you know, a large amount of M4 or C4 uh, class instances, whereas in the non-production case we might just be using, you know, T2 series. Uh, inside each cluster, a namespace for like a larger environment, and then using different access control policies to limit people's use, you know, people's access to different things in those in those namespaces. All right. Next question: Does configuration? Does Kubernetes and or container technologies make configuration management uh, obsolete? Uh, the answer, in, in my opinion, is no, because these solve different types of problems. So you can use some type of configuration management to provision and control the uh, installation of your Kubernetes cluster. So, for example, this also ties into one question, how do you manage the logging on a Kubernetes cluster? So, there's one way to do that, or, you know, a few ways to do that. One way would be that using configuration management on all of the machines that are running Kubernetes to install some sort of log aggregator and ship the logs off to somewhere else. Um, personally, I don't think that, to come back to the question about configuration management, uh, I don't think that it makes sense to apply things like Puppet or Ansible or Chef to building Docker images, but you will always need some sort of tool for configuration management, be it at the individual, say, uh, server level, be it physical or virtual, or even a, if you zoom out from that, even a tool that will allow you to configure a number of, like, say, infrastructure as a service things. So the role and requirements of configuration management tools will continue to, continue to evolve. But we will always need a tool that can say, here is the state that things should be at, run this tool and make sure that things are in the correct state. Okay. Okay, so we have a few questions say, about monitoring, say, how to do continuous monitoring with a with Kubernetes, and another question about what about monitoring? Uh, is it not out of scope? So, talked a little bit about uh, monitoring, but there is a few different ways to go about this. One men one way I mentioned is with the daemon set to run an agent on every node running Kubernetes, where then you can say, like for example, I use I use Datadog, so their agent runs as a container so I can run their Datadog agent on each node in the cluster that will auto-discover all of the other containers running and report metrics about the container, but also integrate with the actual Kubernetes APIs to um, find out the high levels about the cluster and also report that back to uh, Datadog itself. Okay. Oh, here's a fun question. My one of my personal favorite topics. So, any recommendation, any recommended application delivery pipelines on top of K8's Fabric, Distelli, versus Wrecker, or non K8's options, Team City, Circle City, KCI, etc. So, this is a good question, uh, and for me, it really boils down to how do you actually intend to deploy your application. So, if we consider using something like Helm, the thing that would or the decision maker for me would be do any of these tools integrate with the Helm API so that they can trans, you know, seamlessly say, uh, this step in the pipeline has produced a chart, now I want to deploy this chart to this cluster. Versus if I'm just doing something with a deployment to, you know, deployment.yml file, then pretty much any place that I can run kubectl you know, apply from works. So it really comes down to what kind of integrations you need and if you need those delivery pipeline machines to be in a pre-existing network 
Uh, so personally, I have experience with a lot of these different things, but uh, like something like a build cut can be useful. You can actually run these machines in your, on your own infrastructure versus they're just running off in somebody else's data center or some cloud somewhere. So to summarize my answer to that question, is it really comes down to what kind of integrations with you need, integrations you need about how you'll actually be deploying your applications. I think we can do one more question. All right, question. Let's see. Is it possible to make nodes horizontally auto-scaling and create new instances in EC2 depending on cluster load? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, I personally have not uh, done this yet, but the same practices that we apply to, uh, say, horizontally scaling uh, any, uh, any application applies here. So in order to do a auto-scaling, we need to at least have a data point that tells us what the trigger is. So that might be, if we consider an application, this might be CPU usage. If CPU usage goes above a certain point for a certain amount of time, we want to take some action. If it goes below a certain threshold for a certain amount of time, we want to take a action. another action. You can use the Kubernetes monitoring APIs, the data collection APIs, to collect this information and hook that up to, you know, say allocate a new node or remove a node. Now the thing to keep in mind when doing the auto scaling is that you want to integrate with that node maintenance, is what I mentioned earlier, is that telling Kubernetes that, say, a particular node is going to be removed from this cluster, so you should move containers to another node. And then once that has happened, then this node can actually be removed. Right? You don't have to really worry about adding new nodes, but when it comes to removing nodes, you need to take this extra step. So again, I've not actually implemented this yet, only read about it and planned for it, but there might be some projects to uh, automatically handle this. Next question, I think we'll do the last one. Is, do you think Kubernetes secrets are really secure or now combined with uh, HashiCorp Vault, or is the best, or what is the best way for production? That is a good question. And if you are not familiar with secrets in K8, it's frankly a very basic implementation, which is just base64 encoded values. So depending on your particular requirements, it may make sense to look into something uh, more secure. Uh, the question suggests Vault, and yeah, that could basically be better than Base64 and Code of Strings. So if you do care about those things, I suggest you look into that. Uh, and personally, I hope that uh, this area improves uh, over time with support for other backends like Vault and, uh, and things like that. I take one more question quickly. Is Kubernetes appropriate for development environments? Uh, say it depends what you're doing in that particular, what, what for you constitutes a uh, development environment. Uh, if we consider, say, a person or engineer working on a web application where they edit some code, they hit refresh in their browser and expect to see you know, a change, the answer is no, because you're going to have to build an image and then deploy that image to the container, to the cluster, and then we put that to update and, uh, um, you know, before you can interact with it. So in my opinion, you can use Kubernetes for any particular stage in your software development pipeline where you already have an existing image, an existing, say, Docker image or like a rocket image or whatever. Once you have that image, you can use Kubernetes to do like production environments, staging environments, UAT, like test environments, any, anything like that. But in terms of where like your most immediate place where you're say, gonna be running like tests against, like local tests, like unit tests, things like that, then the answer, uh, the answer is no.
Okay, so that's all the time that we have uh, together. So thank you all for attending. I hope that uh, the session was interesting and you learned something. Uh, you can check back to the Cloud Academy blog in the next week or so for a text summary of this webinar and also for a video recording. So thank you, everyone. Good luck out there and happy shipping.